Hey, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Late Night Happy Hour. Brian Kamenetsky, Andy Kamenetsky coming to you Tuesday night. Andy, you know, we have we have a lot of different guests. We do this thing five days a week. A lot of different people coming on the show. Um, some of my favorite episodes that we do, though, um, are ones where we get to really dive into something that speaks to L.A. culture. We've done yeah. old Hollywood. We've done food. We've done all kinds of stuff. Tonight, I'm really excited because uh, we had a conversation earlier today with a guy named Robert Vargas, who is a, an artist and a muralist whose work appears all over the city, um, including downtown, uh, Boyle Heights, the Valley, the West Side, all over the place. Um, and he has a mural that just actually went up on the West Side of Kobe um, that we, we contacted him about. But really, what we what we're able to do is just talk all kinds of stuff about what makes this stuff so important, uh, what makes murals such a part of the city, and it was it was a lot of fun to talk. I learned a ton of stuff that I didn't know. Yeah, I mean, just also too like the the history of this in L.A. You know how it specifically speaks to a lot of the Latino culture, you know, which is obviously very entrenched and part of the fabric of this city, mm -hmm. like. Specifically, too, just like the process of making murals. And in yep. his case, Robert Vargas does it in a very unusual, very specific way that we'll let him talk about. Also, just let, let me just know, say, though, it ain't easy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not easy. I mean, I... I the Var it, it, but the Vargas way particularly seems hard. And also, too, we had him weigh in on a very, very special artist near and dear to our heart, which you will see at the end. Uh, this was very exciting for us. It, it may very well be the first time this particular artist has ever been formally reviewed, so it's very exciting. Yeah, so uh, I'm glad you guys could make it for this one. It sh it's a really, really interesting interview, and obviously uh, then your connections to Kobe and all these other things uh, relevant you know, for, for LA fans uh, and Laker fans as well. So here's our interview with uh, artist Robert Vargas. Hey, Robert, thank you so much for, for coming on and doing this. We really appreciate it. It's great to meet you. Thank you for having me. Great to finally meet you guys. So oh. what 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 got you started in this on this path, like to, to becoming you know a, a muralist and an artist and, and somebody whose work is really all over Los Angeles? I've been painting my whole life. Like I honestly cannot remember wanting to do anything else. There was never a, a plan B. Uh, ever since I could hold something in my hand and create a mark, that was like my first love. So I've been painting my whole life. Do you remember specifically how you got into it, like in terms of the entryway, that sort of thing? Uh, I mean, literally, as soon as I could hold something in my hand and create marks, and as as that uh, progressed, you know, and I showed promise, you know, joining a contest and doing this and doing that as I in grade school, it just you know, became a, uh, you know, just took shape from there. And then I went to uh, the Alley County High School for the Arts here in L.A. And then I went to art school in New York City, Pratt Institute. Shout out to Pratt. Um, but before that, it was just uh, painting. Do you come from a family of artists or is this no, something new for you, like family wise? Me. I think that's what made it kind of uh really really unique and my will to do this and only this was that my uh no one in my immediate family or extended family is uh is a painter or an artist in that way so i just was like that i was that kid that one you know that was always like you know creating and doing stuff and as i learned to um uh, you know learned about art i kind of taught my family also about you know the art art world so yeah how did they react like is you know sometimes you know when you're the one kid or the one person in the family who's doing something different you never know how how the rest of the family will look at it how were you seen in your in your family growing <laughs> up as a as an artistic kid i think they've been um really supportive you know my mom is uh she's my hero and she pretty much you know supported a lot of my uh my you know, need and desire to, to paint and got me materials. She didn't know what she was getting me, but she, I was like, I want that. I need that. I need that to make these marks or, or these colors. And she just 
went for it. And I think, again, because it showed promise or I showed promise in what I was uh, doing, I was very focused and, you know, kept me kept me out of trouble as well. When and how did you specifically get into muralism? Like what, what attracted you to that form in particular? Because you do other work as well. Like we, we talked before that you do you know, abstract impressionistic work. So you're not exclusively a muralist, but what about that specific presentation spoke to you? You know, I, I've always, uh, uh, I think I've always been a student of, of just art and, um, you know, when you're a kid and you see these, these giant, you know, murals painted by Renaissance artists and, and, uh, the Mexican muralists, uh, of, uh, of like Diego Rivera and such, you know, you were inspired by that. And then growing up in Boyle Heights here in California and Los Angeles is, uh, you know, it, it's such a, a rich, has such a rich cultural mural history that I was always surrounded by it. It was, it was easy to be, to kind of have those, that imagery find its way into your kind of process. Can you, there, yeah, I was going to say, were there, were there sort of early things that you saw, Andy, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Robert, that, that, that were part of that, like in, murals you remember as a, you know, growing up or things, you know, particular sure. places that were inspiring to you? Yeah, there was uh, one mural in particular, um, I believe it's called the Boyle Heights Corridor, which is on Soto and, and then Brooklyn Avenue, which is now Cesar Chavez, um, which was always one that I, um, that I gravitated towards because I saw it a lot. And then um, another, uh, Another mural which celebrated the Olympics here in 1984, um, which is on uh, on Broadway in downtown, but it's created by the same artist from from Boyle Heights in East East LA. Um, so that kind of aesthetic was something that was was very inspiring to me. And I think I think the one here in downtown is about four stories tall, and for me that was just like the biggest thing in the world. It was like a pyramid, you know. So to be painting a mural like I'm painting now, or the size of murals that I paint now, and to think back at, at that, at what impact that had on me to go big uh, is pretty cool. Can you explain for people who may be unfamiliar the that connection um, with muralism and Boyle Heights and like specifically that history culturally? Well, Boyle Heights is a, uh, you know, is was like the Ellis Island of the West Coast. I mean, so many different cultures first made, um, you know, made their home base Boyle Heights from, you know, of course, the, the Jewish community to the Russian community, the Japanese community, um, the Latin community. It's uh, it has an, a, a real amazing his cultural background um, that I think um, fosters a lot of creativity and a lot of um, creative expression. And of course, the murals of the uh, of the 70s and early 80s with the Chicana movement really spoke to where uh, where those people were um, at that point in time fighting for uh, human rights and migrant workers' rights. Um, there were a lot of protests, and I think that um, those murals, especially the ones that still survive, are are a real uh, a real big part of LA history. Even though they're located in Boyle Heights, a real big part of LA history and and moving, um, I think the the whole community forward. Yeah, see, that's the mural on Soto and Brooklyn there, mm -hmm. Soto and Cesar Chavez. So seeing that as a kid, I was just like, wow, following the narrative, following uh, just, uh, you know, there's a dollar dance uh, right there. You know, you see these things as, ki as, a, as a kid and um, it's super inspiring. How, how, how important are they to the community? Um, very. I mean, especially the, the, you know, the community that's been there for a long time. I think mm -hmm. the younger generation um should read up on who these artists were and why they were painted <clears throat> i think uh 
it would help hopefully keep them from getting vandalized. Uh, that one in particular does seem to get vandalized a lot because it's in a high traffic area. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's still standing strong. What's the maintenance and preservation process when it comes to murals and, and keeping them, you know, around for decades and stuff like that? Well, I I definitely think like the type of paint that you use needs to be able to weather uh, the, you know, the, the time and also um, having the right kind of protectant like sealer over it to uh, protect it from the weather elements. And, and if it does get... Uh, vandalize it's able to you're able to wash that that layer off without just without destroying the the under layer which is the the painting itself from the outside looking in and, and i may be completely incorrect about this you know sort of projecting my own impressions on it but muralism versus like more conventional paintings on a conventional canvas even a large one it reminds me a little bit of like the difference between acting in theater where you often on have film. to, yeah, versus on film and right, you know, the, right, the projection right. process sure. and the way details, you know, certain ones translate on film that don't translate the exact way from the stage and the actor has to, you know, accommodate and adjust for that. How do, how is the process of details when it comes to working a, a mural versus some of the other stuff that you might do on a canvas in in terms of creating details, figuring out ones that will translate what you want to do, that sort of thing? Well, for me, I, my approach is, is very similar to the way I would work in my studio versus the way I would work outdoors. Um, you know, I'd like to think of my approach to the muralism, to the murals that I create outdoors as really it being my outdoor gallery, my outdoor mm -hmm. studio where it's accessible for people to, to take part in. And honestly, where people otherwise wouldn't have access to the artists in that kind of creative space. Um, I do feel that a mural with the right message, you know, at the right time, at the, in the right location, has the ability to really transcend the community. And um, that's, that's pretty important. Um, to be able to utilize your platform as an artist to to hopefully affect change. It's so interesting, just, and we're gonna we're gonna show people some of the some some of the things that you've done in the process, literally the process of making it. Um, but when you mentioned being part of the community, what is that like? Because like you know, what, what some of the things we'll show people, like you're literally pulling people off the streets to include them in some of the work that you're doing. How is it different for you as an artist when you are right in front of the community that you're painting and doing something that will be for the community? Um, how, how does that impact what you're doing? Well, that's that's my process is painting from life. I much prefer painting from life than to use any kind of photographs as references. Mm -hmm. So I feel very comfortable in that space, uh, pulling someone randomly from the street who just happens to inspire me or has a certain face that's like a vehicle for me to be able to tell a story. So when uh, when I'm pulling someone from the street to be part of a larger narrative, um, the idea really is to to create a mural that mirrors a community that the mural has to live, you know, uh, that that's where the mural is located. Because I I think that there's a big opportunity to be able to to connect with with the people and not uh, keep people like at arm's length. Like I don't have headphones, kind of doing my own thing, tuning people out, but actually no headphones keeping people within arm's reach so that they're connected to the piece that's being created. And, uh, you know, and once an artist leaves an area, you know, you have to think about the people that have to live with that mm -hmm. and how, how it affects them. So by painting someone of standing in the community, elevating the everyday person to this monumental hero, um, it, it doesn't become something that's, 
that's abstract to the community, but now a part of the landscape that's that's there every day. And you've painted in the, you've painted on the west side. You've painted downtown. You've painted in the <laughs> valley. You've painted All everywhere around Los Angeles. Yeah. So when 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 you're thinking about those things and leaving something into the community and the people that are there, do, how how do you account for the differences? You know, and there's there they are so like these neighborhoods around LA are very different. Sure. How do you account for that when you're doing these paintings and creating these works? Well, I mean, LA has has tons of flavor, you know, from the south side, east side, west side, north side. And, you know, although I'm based here in uh in downtown Los Angeles, I mean I'm six generations Angelino where a lot of this flavor is is really just kind of in my DNA. So I'm I'm used to going, you know, to all these places and, and vibing that out. And I love painting murals in these different pockets because, you know, if I'm painting something in Venice, there's, you know, a different culture that's happening out there with with uh just just because it's located so close to the water or um you know when you're painting in downtown it's just this this you know kind of gritty thing or um you know, everything's bigger or painting in Boyle Heights where it's much more regional. And, uh, that's, uh, I'm just showing people your Instagram page. You can get kind sure, of a feel for it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great opportunity to, to connect with people. Also, depending on where you are in the mural, like if, is it a mural that's, that's four stories tall or something where you're up on a, on a scaffold where you're kind of not really accessible versus a two story mural where you're closer to the ground and you're able to have that interaction. Yeah, and this is what you look like uh, that high up. Uh, you get people perspective <laughs> yeah. of what it looks like. Uh, well, did, there's not, not much room for error there. Does anybody, mm -hmm. uh, if you pull them out from a crowd, get a kickback or anything? <laughs> Participation, <laughs> stuff like that? <laughs> You know, so, I, I, we'll, we'll position ourselves strategically around you. Well, I'm, all, I'm also time. trying. I'm trying to get you volunteers, Robert. Like if, if people realize, you know, there might oh, be a little scratch in it for them. They're, they're there. They're okay. there. I mean, you, you get an opportunity to be part of a something that's uh, that that will last, you know, for a long, long time, and you get to be a part of that story. At, I mean, how do you say no? Well, the, there's. It's not that you say no. I'm just giving you better ways to say yes. <laughs> there's a, there's a difference. I don't I don't expect anybody to say no. I'm trying to get you the best of the best the in best terms of the, the people that, right. that that Someone you might use. Moment. Exactly. Um. So you, Brian, are are you about to queue up the? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pulling it up. If you want to start talking about it, sure. Um. You've got you've got a uh, a recent piece of Kobe that is up at the uh, the Zambezi uh, advertising agency. Um, can, you, can you explain a little bit of how that ended up happening as we get that ready to show people? Sure, well, shout out to Zambezi and the whole, uh, the whole team out there. Chris yeah, they're Jean. great. Um, what was an incredible process um, and experience. Now, Kobe, uh, for those who don't know, actually was a co-founder of Zambezi. Yes. And um, so there's Kobe DNA there. And we actually had discussed, uh, me and, the, and Zambezi had discussed creating this mural prior to Kobe's passing. Um, and COVID hit, a lot of things, you know, obviously happened and it just got put on the back burner. But it was already, it was already inked and ready to go. I was actually going to start, I think, the week of or the, the two weeks before everything shut down. And now, uh, having the opportunity, we felt like this was the time to uh, to resume. And I unveiled it on 224, which is exactly a year from Kobe's uh, memorial service here in LA. Mm -hmm. And the whole the whole background to this mural is uh, the title of the piece is called "Together We Stand," and it's all about. Um, LA's resiliency, LA's uh, adaptability during these times, and Kobe and his iconic kind of like Mamba mentality post saying, "LA, you've got this." So here, it's a just a rally, rallying cry for Angelinos to be able to um, hopefully just instill that that Kobe mentality mantra of just uh, um, belief in yourself and. Um, you know, I often 
reference a lot of Kobe's uh, um, approaches to to his craft the way I approach it to, to mine. Uh, I mean, and it's it's fitting uh, actually beyond what he means to LA, just in the appreciation and aspirations Kobe had as an artist himself. And, I mean, it's it's in part what led him to Zambezi in the first place. I mean, Kobe exactly. was very he was very into expression like that and creativity like that. You know, anybody who knows his background in you know commercial spots that he did even before he went into, as he used to always call it, storytelling, he was very hands-on in the process and was, you know, in a lot of ways, an idea factory for this stuff. Totally, totally. And to be able to create this mural um, right where, uh, you know, he was starting to make that that transition into mm -hmm. these other creative, like, um, realms is, is, uh, is really, really cool. And again, all, this whole mural and all of my murals are all painted without any kind of grids. Or yeah, I was going to ask you that because you're just like going on this gigantic wall and just going yeah. after it here. That that's got to be hard. <laughs> I mean, that's that's all freehand, no grids, no projections, no stencils, just uh, all brushwork. And um, it's it's honestly it's the only way I've ever worked. So I don't know anything different, but I I do know that for me that kind of freedom without having anything kind of pre predetermined there just allows me the the creative space to to kind of audible whenever uh right use sports term an audible whenever whenever i want so what what when you're thinking about a a shape you know the, the this building has a particular shape and you know uh kobe's meaning to the community is different now um than it than it was right. before how do you go from this is the space that I have to work with to this is the 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 picture that I want to put up there and the message that I want to create? And how did you get there in this case too? Well, that particular every wall has its own its own. You, you're building your own relationship to it, and um, I knew the pose that I wanted to do and actually the image that I was referencing is facing the other way um, but because it was taller on one side and you know I wanted to really get the height of, of Kobe's head and fit the jersey in there it it obviously fit going the reverse and also the traffic on Jefferson Boulevard where it's located is you know is closer to that wall and he's also facing uh, Zambezi. So um, I thought that would be a, a better a better layout. And of course, just the Together We Stand script is just my own handwriting, me writing it um, in there right before I unveiled it. That was a finishing touch. That's really cool, actually. Yeah, really I didn't cool. know that. That That's that's an awesome detail. Um, th this is, by the way. Well, the other detail you notice, the, the patch that he's wearing. Yeah. You know, oh, the, yeah. which, is, which is a patch for Gigi, yeah, on on his jersey, and then in his uh, his bandaged finger there mm -hmm. is the uh, two four. Uh, wow. It's just kind of handwritten in there. So, right. and of course, and the bandage, of course, the bandaged finger is just one of those iconic things that everybody remembers, you know, from him, from all the broken fingers and all the time right. he played with that stuff. Because it speaks to the like resiliency and 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 seeing seeing it through. So, but it also it also references the um, unveiling date, which was two twenty four. Right. Um, this is actually uh, one of three Kobe works that that you've done. This is a uh, right here a picture of you working on um, a different image of Kobe it, as an artist. Because you know, I mean, Kobe had this really expressive personality very expressive face it, in the process of doing three different pieces involving kobe like what what did you discover about him just from an artistic standpoint in, in terms of details uh his essence that sort of thing i mean there's uh there's three distinct um there's three murals that i painted with kobe and they're all distinct in their in their expression you know the, for example the one we just looked at with with his fist up he's like kind of mama mentality you got this 
uh, the one that we were just looking at that I was painting, uh, he's almost like, you know, yeah, looking at the shot clock, just kind of um, visualizing the the sequence before it happens. Um, and this this mural was painted a week after he passed at the live at the LA Art Show at the Convention Center. Mm -hmm. So this was only visible for five days that the show was up um, and was commissioned by them uh, as part of their their permanent collection. But painting this one was probably the most emotional because it had just happened. And um, um, yeah, it was there was a lot going on in that one. So just that relationship of of just kind of my having my own dialogue with Kobe and saying my my uh my my way of saying thank you and and goodbye and also um to you know thanks for the inspiration and 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 how and thinking about how I was going to use that uh some of those those some of the inspiring words that he said and how I was going to incorporated into my work moving forward and even in those pieces you know one of the one of the things that and, and, you know we've becoming familiar with your work um that i that i thought was awesome uh was a and i i think it's on it's on downtown starbucks like around 8th street correct is the mural that you spring. made six okay six in the spring i was having the Ball yeah, you were, you were close. <laughs> um, there's a, there's a moment from creating this mural, and we'll be able to show people the the rest of it, where a guy and people might be able to read it on the side here, named Craig, who is a, a homeless a homeless person who who lives near this Starbucks. You created this mural in the community, and watching, I, I found this to be amazing. Like watching him, watching you paint yeah, him. It, and you wrote in the Instagram post, my collaboration with Starbucks is underway. Mm -hmm. And the first model of the night was a man from the DTLA mm -hmm. community that I see here every day named Craig. He is one of several people that I will be selecting to each day from the audience over the next few days to tell this story, representing hashtag community, hashtag change and hashtag unity. Thanks to everybody that came through. When you, when you see like, you know, is there a difference to you? when you see somebody in the community because this is somebody who's not seen you know homeless people are typically not seen by by people in the community right. versus creating somebody like kobe bryant who is iconic you know who is uh instantly recognizable is is there any difference in the way you approach or or look at it or or paint people um you know, kind of just reflecting the the difference the different spaces that people fill inside the community around LA. Sure, um, painting painting people such as you know Craig here is is also my way of of bringing more attention and awareness to the homeless community. Here's someone who maybe just prior to me putting down that first stroke was was sleeping just steps away from there. And, you know, on the ground where no one was really paying attention to him. And then by just, you know, I have a relationship with him because I see him in the community often. So we know each other. So asking him to be a part of this and, um, you know, hiring him to, to be a part mm -hmm. of this, giving him something. And then now by me uh, giving him this, this attention and, and the platform, other people that were there now, you know, are, are looking at him differently. It's not that I see him any different than I would see, you know, a celebrity really. Um, for me, it's all the same, but I think what matters when I paint someone in this live setting is that other people then see him differently. And that, uh, that intangible goes a long way because now now he's not maybe so so off-putting or so scary or so um, uh, whatever is going on in their minds. But maybe now it's like, okay, now I have a name. His name's Craig. Maybe the next time I, I walk through here, I'll say hi to him because I remember him when Vargas painted him. And uh, he's actually a cool guy. Like we got to hear him speak. I've seen him many times, but I've never I've never heard him speak. And now I, I know what he sounds like. Um, and I, I maybe will share a little bit of his story 
a little bit of our story and our interactions over the years to these people who are also just random people watching me paint. And now uh, the narrative becomes, you know, unity. And, and this is, uh, I believe, the, the finished product, correct? That's the finished product over the course of about seven days, six days, um, where um, when the riots happened after the, the uh, during the George Floyd protests, that Starbucks, which is across from my studio, was completely demolished. And what I did was the very next day they had boarded it up and I wanted to create something that showed solidarity with what was happening. But at the same time, hopefully um, reclaim our neighborhood back. And I painted George Floyd's eyes with the words justice uh, that went through it. Uh, it's it's somewhere in there you might want to find. And that mural was there from June until November. And Starbucks now couldn't take it down. It was like the wall belonged to the community now. Right. Um, and it was it, it wasn't touched that entire time. But the cool thing about what Starbucks did is rather than just, OK, everything seemed to die down. Let's take the uh, let's take this mural down and just put our glass back up. They were like, why don't we collaborate on something? What do you recommend we do? And I was like, let's collaborate on on a piece where the it goes from moment to movement and we create a permanent mural that goes inside of Starbucks and as a uh, as a nod to to the to the diversity the cultural diversity in the area show solidarity with what happened and also this uh this particular location that Starbucks was the first thing to get broken into and looted the entire um uh you know, riots. So what I wanted to do was pay, pull people from the crowd of, of different ethnic backgrounds, completely random, and put them in this mural and then in the mural lock their arms. So it seems like they're marching down Spring Street from City Hall in the background, um, just fighting for change, fighting for peace, love, unity, and um, inclusivity. Which is which? Which is not. It's more than just one um, group of people, but for all people, and uh, you know, we all got each other's backs. Obviously, the, this period over the summer was pretty brutal on a, on a lot of levels, in in terms sure. of you know what the country went through, but also you know specifically L.A. and you know, but from an artistic standpoint, do, is there? Is there inspiration that can be mined from it that, that you look at and say, all right, th this is this is something that can be part of my work moving forward? Not I, I don't mean it like to try to spin what happened over the summer, but I'm just saying in terms of the way artists draw from what what is around them and, and the world as it exists in those moments. Absolutely. I mean, it, through the course of history, artists have garnered inspiration from from you know these historic events uh, uh, causes um, to be able to shed light on them um, I think it's a responsibility that an artist has to be able to also heal through the creative process bring people together through the creative process and um, um, yeah create awareness for the greater good yeah, I, I I would imagine that when something like this happens, your your mind starts turning in in terms of you know what what is what is my reaction to this? How am I going to present my react? I, you know, and and what are what are the ways that I can make sense of this for people? I well, I think I think artists have the exact same response that everybody else has. We just happen to have a platform or the ability to hopefully transcend and articulate the, our feelings into this imagery that can hopefully galvanize a community. For example, um, my your response was probably as similar to my response, except now you guys have a platform to be able to at least maybe say something about it where yeah. other people's voices, you know, they don't have the... the yeah. The, 
the platform for it. So I, I don't make the distinction between artists and the next person. I just think that as artists, we're able to, you know, to transform that into something. How, how do you, because you, you talked when we first, at the beginning of the conversation, you talked about the history uh, you know the references to Cesar Chavez and this the the, the 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 it's the storytelling that goes and marks very specific times um, right. in different communities in different movements. How do you think the art that is being created today out of the movement that we're seeing now that the work that you did over the summer, the work that other people did, um, you know, memorializing different figures, all all of those things. How do you think this will tie in with with that history that you described that is so important with murals around the city? Well, I, I look back to ancient times when people would erect monuments and um, uh, to show that they existed, that those civilizations were around. And we're no different living in a time where there's you know, we always seem to think that the most interesting times were are behind us, but we're also living through, um, you know, incredible times. And to be able to record these moments visually through these, you know, modern monuments of these murals or, or uh, well, with these murals, um, I think it's a it's a great testament to say that we were here, we existed. There was there was a Kobe Bryant. We I lived in the time of Kobe Bryant. And I lived in the time of Dolores Huerta, and I lived in the time of um, Craig, you know? <laughs> right. And, and here's someone where who probably won't have any kind of marker to say that he was here. Um, you know, when he dies, you know how I'll know? When I walk to Starbucks, I'll no longer see him there. Right. And whatever happened to him, he, one day he'll just disappear. But you go inside Starbucks and there's a great image of Craig there holding a sign that says uh, love. It's funny because and people may not realize who it is that they're talking about. But there is an interesting expression that, you know, you you don't die until people stop talking about For, you. Like, talk, you know, forget your name. Right. Yeah. Until they forget your name. And people may not know Craig's name, but they'll know that face and they'll be able to. So in some ways, you're taking him and 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 preserving his story and preserving his life in a way that and it's it's to me feels more profound than um, there are a lot of people who are going to remember Kobe. I don't mean to minimize you know the, no, I, I know the importance of Kobe, but like that you also are doing that with somebody like Craig. I right. think is is very profound. Um, thank you. It's just. Uh you know, living in downtown and, and thinking about the world community. Um, I, I was always um, inspired by this, uh, this poem that um, Dr. King wrote called World House, you know, it speaks about um, everybody, this world community and us being in this, imagine the world being this house and everybody, uh, uh, they're not being, we're only families apart, you know, uh, between different races and cultures. And I I am blessed to be able to have the ability to kind of share other people's stories um, through my work. And in doing so, there's as much me in those stories as the other person's stories. So it becomes a bit autobiographical as well. Um, last thing we have for you, um, you are a very big sports fan. You're familiar with all the LA teams, all the coverage, which means by definition, you are familiar with our friend Steve Mason. And you may you may not realize this, but Steve Mason has a background that uh, not only uh, includes candle making and uh, appearing in short films that he produced, and by the way, only short films that he produced. That was basically the only work that he got. But uh, Mace has a background as an artist. So we thought it would be fun if you would take – well, we didn't know. You did. This was though. this was only uncovered on our uh, when we had Mason on on Friday. We learned a, a great deal about him, including that he was a candle maker. Yes, Chandler, I think is an appropriate word. He's a Chandler. <laughs> well, right? he didn't know it. Right? <laughs> he didn't know that was the term. But uh, we we yeah. wanted to show you um, an original Mace that oh he created. God. Are you going to have me critique this? <laughs> well, yes. first, I mean, when you when you look at it, Robert, what, what do you see? What in, is in, what is in that? Piece? 
<laughs> I see. I see. Mason, if you're listening, I see spirit number one. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, a, a abstraction. You know, a, a I think I haven't seen anything like this since the uh, the caves of Lascaux in in France. If you had to, if you had to look at this, Robert, and, and try to gauge Mace's influences, like where, where, what do you think are the influences that helped create this painting? Like the famous artists that we, the the, the touchstones of the art world. The touchstones of the art world. Um, I see some Picasso there. I see some Fauvism with some uh, Matisse. Uh, I think there's a. There's a touch of uh, of Don Bacardi there from uh, Los Angeles. I was say Ron Bacardi. <laughs> Ron, yeah, a touch of Bacardi, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's a touch of Bacardi there. I'm sure it was was used to create this. <laughs> and we won't let you duck the question any longer. What do you see, Robert? What is it? What is it? I I see, I mean. <laughs> I see a profile, right? So yes, a, that's a, what I thought it was. A profile of his that's face, a self right? A self-portrait. Well, you see, now that is what I actually thought that it was, Robert. It a self-portrait? It, well, it's of sorts. It is uh, of Mace in a yoga pose. Um, it, it's it's <laughs> your look of surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking. As opposed to his face, that, shocking. Because yeah. I think well, you know what I kind of—is it like half of the yoga pose? Can we go back to it? Yes. So he's it's in like a, almost like a it's the colors of the chakras. Oh, okay. Wow. Just just <laughs> moving moving sports forward, moving the art world forward. Wow, Mace is uh, he misses calling there. Now well, I, we all know that art is priceless. You can't put a value on some of these things. Um, how I much would, would value on that? <laughs> how much would you be willing to, <laughs> to pay for for a work like that to hang in your in your personal residence or, or studio or perhaps some of the finest galleries um, in this city <laughs> or others? I would I would do a trade. I, I would okay. do a trade of some sort. A trade of some sort. I think he would come out ahead. <laughs> whatever, whatever scraps you have lying around I mean, that you're is, willing to give him for that, is, is that's there actually an, an art, offer he would, would probably take you up? Is on. there an art world equivalent of a salary dump trade? Like, because it sounds like <laughs> what you would be doing. Here. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Man, well, I'm be, sorry. Let me do it. I'm sorry. Be it's ready. So be ready for some sort of thing to happen now where Steve Mason uh, takes you up on the offer to trade one of his paintings for one of yours because that is a significant I would think upgrade. A cup of coffee or something. <laughs> um, really, really quick before we let you go, just to make yeah. sure it's covered, will you let people know the, the world record that you are embarking upon so it, just so it makes sure it's clear? Yes. So I am in the middle of, uh, in the midst of painting the largest mural in the world by a single artist right here in the heart of downtown Los Angeles at the corner of 5th and Hill Streets, located right across the street from Pershing Square. And Kobe is featured prominently in this mural, about eight stories tall, with his arms up in victory, um, just leading the charge. And this mural really is a, a legacy mural to, mural to celebrate just, again, our cultural diversity, our, our uh, um, our unity and and just where we are at this point in time. Um, all right, so at, you can check out all of his work at on Instagram at the Rob at the Robert Vargas. There's so much stuff in there that's just great to look at and and different things uh, for people to go see. Check out your work all over the city um, and you know of course the the new Kobe mural that's down uh, off Jefferson on the west side. I just wanted to quickly mention, I am starting a new mural, um, and it's related to sports this coming uh, this coming weekend in Boyle Heights, which is kind of cool because I get to come back home and create a, a mural there. And it's a, I'm teaming up with Adidas and oh, cool. the Mexican uh, national fo uh, soccer team for the release of their brand new jersey, which is going to be uh, coming out this twenty the, the 22nd, I believe, of March. 
and I'm going to create a mural uh, that again speaks to the importance of of uh, soccer in um, in in our lives, especially here in uh, in Southern California. And can people come watch you do that? Absolutely. I'm going to be located at the intersection of Whittier Boulevard and Lorena Streets, which is really the corridor between East LA and Boyle Heights. Cool. And, uh, yeah, come out. Check it Whittier out. Whittier Lorena. That's awesome. Well, you can see you can watch this process happen. Go see Robert Vargas put this uh, this mural up in Boyle Heights, and while you're there, check out all the other murals in Boyle Heights and get a feel for the history of things it's a really you know it's something that I, I i think i may do myself is just kind of take a tour around the city and just look at this stuff and really uh, try to deepen my i've been here 20 something years and but still could get a deeper understanding of what's going on in this city uh robert vargas thank you so much for taking the time to do this we really appreciate it. this was fun thank you guys and remember when i when i paint a mural in st louis uh it's going to be the the Kamenetsky brothers. Nice. Right? Yes, that's what Not the, the city needs. Brothers. It'll be you guys, but with like a plane, like the Wright brothers, but the Kamenetsky brothers, like Spirit of St. Louis. Love it. That is fantastic. We'll do it. Man. We'll do it. We, that's See, awesome. the wheels are already turning. There, was there you go. There you go, man. It's great meeting you, man. Thank you very Likewise. much. Thank you, guys. Andy, I can think of nothing that the city of St. Louis needs more than a mural of the two of us. Well, uh, arguably the I, I most accomplished and most important citizens I can think ever of something produced. they need more. Two murals of us. Multiple <laughs> mural, mural, mural yeah. I. Oh, absolutely. Look, Jay Her uh, 17 says in the chat right now, I'd go to St. Louis to see that. I can promise Jay Her is not alone on this one. Absolutely. Like, I mean, they would <laughs> tourist trip, trap though, says. tourist trap might be a little too strong. But I guarantee it becomes an attraction. I mean, like, it might do. not be that big dinosaur out in Arizona or something, but it's still pretty big. People know the arch. People know the arch. You take a canvas, you stretch it in so it just takes up the entire inside. Our faces. There you go. I think St. Louis would appreciate that. There you go. The Nathan Mark says he'd fly in from New Zealand. I, I, again, this, this thing would be a sensation. There's no question. Sector Cruz says, have Alex Caruso in it with us. He'd be like a third Kamenetsky. I say, why not? <laughs> it's just a mural of us all shaving our balls. <laughs> People were upset with the amount of time we spent on ball shaving on our last podcast. You know Harrison what? Fagan. You know what? We have never, ever presented this show the lando lakers you know any anything we've ever done espn 710 we've never said it's for everybody we only promise to be ourselves so you know if those That's people right. don't like the amount of ball shaving content in that podcast or any future content we create you know what there are plenty of other options out there so that's right i'm not worried about it um i do want to say before we like the 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 part um obviously this the work is really cool is the the time lapse stuff to watch how this works um was really neat to see i that story that he that i tell you know, when we asked him about you know i was always been kind of meaningful to me like the idea that you you live until people stop talking about you until they yeah. stop telling stories or forget about you or whatever it might be and you know for some people that that might be decades it might be forever you know hundreds of years whatever but for other people it could be the instant they're gone. It could be before they're gone. And like to see, to see why it's, it, it is so important to him to, to include people who aren't typically seen in his work. You know, Robert talking about that um, was something that I thought was really profound. And, you know, so many of these people, and I, I don't know if you do this too, Andy, but like I look at old photographs from the thirties, forties and fifties, just like wonder what happened to those people. They've been gone for so long. Um, it's cool that people are going to be seen in this city and thought about in one form or another, you know, because of work like this and from him and from other people. Yeah. I mean, look, at the end of the day, everybody wants to feel like they mattered mm -hmm. and in, you know, it would be disingenuous to say that everybody matters the exact same way in terms of grand scale. I mean, we all. I would like to think matter to somebody, but you know, it would be disingenuous to say that Craig, who we were talking about before, would touch as many lives as Kobe. I, I'm not going to patronize Craig by saying that, but Craig does matter, and mm -hmm. you know, it's his likeness in that mural is a reminder of how he and everybody else 
in this city, in this world matters on some level. So I, I agree with you. It did the, the, the foresight that he would have to actually be thinking about something like that. And, you know, the artistic drive and compulsion to make that part of his creations is it's pretty special. Yeah. To watch, to watch that guy who is so rarely seen, watch himself be painted in that way. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was powerful. Um, so check yes. out, uh, Robert Vargas's Instagram, the real Robert Vargas on, uh, on Instagram, as you can see, a lot of that kind of stuff—the the, time lapse and all those other things—and we'll we'll keep tweeting some of it out uh, tomorrow as well. Before we go, though, obviously the big news of the day, um, sports-wise, with the NBA still on the All Star break, was Myers Leonard. Yeah. Um, who are we? I mean, do we say the word? I I, I mean, I, I don't. I don't think we need to. I mean, I, right? Well, if you missed the news, he used an anti-Semitic slur as. In part of his begins with a K, four letters. Y'all know what it is. Y'all know it. Um, the, 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 he his excuse was that he didn't know what it meant. Yeah, this was during this was during um, he was might have been Call of Duty or some game it's, like it's that. He one was of these playing, gamer things. right. He, he was on playing on channel. Twitch. Yeah, he's playing on Twitch channel. He's apparently a very avid gamer with uh. <laughs> up until today sponsors and stuff like that uh those went away um and he directed certainly his manashevitz sponsorship is gone yeah he he, he directed the it was hard to, for, at least for people like us who are not gamers i don't know if this was exactly being directed at somebody that he was playing against or a, i don't know but either way it was uh a pr disaster for him right now he is Currently away from the Miami Heat, while the league investigates this, he put out um, investigating. By the way, is is most likely meaning scouring this stuff to see what else he might have said. Right. I mean, they, they were um, investi I mean, the, they're kind investigating. They're investigating how long. <laughs> right. Well, they're investigating how long to punish him. Ultimately, like that's right. really what this investigation uh, comprises. Um, he put out um, an apology on Instagram that. Felt very PR-ish written, and also where he claimed to have not known what the word actually meant, that that it was a derogatory slur towards Jewish people. Right. Did um, which, you buy that? No. That no. I mean, I, I will say this. It's a very, very specific word, mm -hmm. so, and he said it seeming to get that there was something derogatory behind it, like just in the way that he phrased this. So either he is lying or he is exceptionally unlucky in this case. It's one or the other, and there is no in-between. Like, could I could I believe perhaps that he did not realize the degree to which it is that heinous a slur? Like, you know, that that it's basically the anti-Semitic version of the N-word. Like, mm -hmm. could I believe that he did not realize that it was at that level? Perhaps. Do I think that he had that he genuinely did not realize it had anything to do with the Jewish faith and Jewish people? That strikes me as it's incredibly tough, right? unlikely. I, I, I especially saw... when he did not actually. If if that's really the case, you need to clarify immediately what you thought it meant. I would. Agree. That's the part that it's like. Okay, what did you think it means? But like, I. I... I agree with you, and you know, look, I'm a 45 year old Jewish guy. I know what the word means. Um, you know, I, I've I've heard it used. I've seen it done. I mean, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I, you know, when I went, I went to Vanderbilt. Um, there were people there who had never met Jews, like sure. never. Sure. Um, not necessarily a ton, but like, like who would come up and ask me questions that I like, were kind of jaw dropping to me just in their sort of curiosity or whatever, but like the sort of ignorant curiosity that goes along with it. And, um, so that was a bit of, so, and I would have thought that like, it's kind of impossible. To, he's 29 years old to not know what that word means. I did see a tweet though, from someone I'll take them at their, at their word in our feed at cam brothers, where they said like, that's not a word I did. I was like, I I'm almost embarrassed to say like, I didn't know what that meant. Okay. Like I, I didn't know what that word meant. So 
up to that point, I would have been like, come on, he is a person. He went to college. He went, you know, he's been in, you know, around the world as a basketball player and all this stuff to not know what it means. But the part that gets me is the one that you that you mentioned, like, okay, if you didn't know what it means, what did you think it means? Because I mean, you I would... put it in front of, you know, in front of bitch, which is, you know, as a, as a pejorative in front of another pejorative. Again, if so, what if did you, you think? If you are to take Myers Leonard at face value on this, it, or if I were in Myers Leonard's shoes and this was me and I genuinely did not know what the word meant, you know, just how high on the scale of anti-Semitic slurs that it was, I would have included what I thought it meant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, if you're going to offer that, you need to be as transparent as possible, I think. Because what you don't want, it, you only get one shot at putting out this type of statement, apology, however you want to frame it. You need to be as clear as possible in what you're saying. and the you have to know ahead of time too that a lot of people aren't going to a lot of people aren't going to find it believable that you didn't right. know what it meant so if you're going to make that claim you need to include all of the information i agree because like as nathan mark points out if you don't know the word and he just said in the comment before like he did um you know nathan didn't but like if you don't know the word then how do you say it like well, he obviously I mean, thought it meant something i was going to say here, he, he perhaps thought it was a different type of derogatory statement that perhaps, again, was not specific towards Jewish people, I suppose. I, the part that I, I want, because like, look, Myers Leonard is, the NBA is a, the NBA and the NBA fans and generally is a, what would be considered a progressive, politically progressive group of people relative to baseball fans, relative sure. to the NFL, whatever it might be. Myers Leonard was not the most popular guy to begin with because he was somebody who made a point of not kneeling in the bubble and you know all of that stuff. You know, whether it's for whatever reason, at the time, I, I I don't think it's fair to paint people as racist because they didn't kneel. Um, but he was he starts this conversation and this controversy from a place that is fair or not going he the assumptions have been made already about Myers Leonard and that I think complicates what happens from here like because that's the part that I find fascinating like he's been suspended essentially by the heat who by the way are owned by a Jewish guy uh Mickey Harrison um awkward yes <laughs> um I I don't have a problem you know, I know cancel culture is a big thing right now and all that stuff and people rail against it, whatever. I, I don't have a problem though with that. The, cancel culture is not the same thing as like, you know, being anti that is not the same thing as being against consequence free speech. And in 2021, he, he, Myers Leonard is a professional basketball player. There is nowhere he goes where it's even a semi public forum, like a play, like a, a, a gaming room on Twitch where what he says is private. It's not. It, if you're talking to other people, you're talking to people as a representative of the Miami Heat, as a professional basketball player and all that stuff. And if you say stupid shit or you know, anti-Semitic shit, racist shit, they're going to be misogynistic shit. Yes, there, which that was. It was just kind of clouded by the anti-Semitism. It's going to be... There are going to be consequences. What, what I think is going to be really interesting moving forward with this situation with Myers Leonard Bryan is a, a lot of how a lot of how his future will bear out moving forward, whether with the whether with the Heat, whether in this league. A lot of that has to do with the fallout, not just publicly, but internally inside your own locker room and inside the league with your own peers. And what I think is really will be interesting to try to gauge is just how upset NBA players around the league are about this because you know the NBA is not a league with much in the way of Jewish representation when it comes to NBA players and that, it's just, that line in airplane yeah <laughs> how about this leaflet famous right. Jewish sports heroes and, and the reason I bring that up is because we've seen incidents like what happened with Riley Cooper, uh, the Philadelphia Eagle receiver 
mm -hmm. you know, several years ago who was at a, I think a Kenny Chestnut concert and was clearly very, very drunk, gotten to a thing with some black concert goers called one of them the N-word. And it, it became a thing of real tension on that team. Um, he ended up needing to lean on guys like Mike Vick, who really stuck out his neck for Riley Cooper in that in that situation. And the real the reason it was necessary for Vic or other teammates to do something like that is because obviously you're talking about a league with a high composition of black players. And mm -hmm. this is going to be something that speaks more directly to them. It'll be interesting to see how this situation with Myers Leonard actually speaks to players around the league. And I, and I want to make it clear, I'm not saying that they would necessarily be indifferent to it or not care or not think like, that's fucked up. But in terms of how actually angry they are about it, in a lot of ways, will dictate how big a deal this is for Myers Leonard. Yeah, I, mean, I think what we're what we're really going to see is a is a referendum on what people really think about him. You know, like in the bubble, people said his teammates said the right things and whatever, and they didn't make a controversy out of him not kneeling. But we will find out if they really do believe Myers Leonard is at his core a good guy, a good person, a redeem, you know, whatever it is, because how much they stick up for him, um, is part of it. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know what the right answer is in terms of, you know, should he never be allowed to play basketball? I, it's a, you know, the heat don't have to play him. Well, he, um, look, he's actually, else, he's barely played this year at all. Right. He didn't he's play, been hurt a lot. Right. He basically didn't play in the bubble at all for the heat. And at the end of this year, the, they have a team option on him. I which, suspect they will not be opting. Well, the only reason I, it feels like at this point that they would uh, uh, opt into it is just to have him as a trade piece. Yeah. I mean, it's that's it. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it, it'll, I, I don't know what the right answer to this is. It would be, you know, we've talked about compartmentalizing things. You know, you compartmentalize a lot more for people who are better at basketball than Mar Myers Leonard is. Yeah. Um, you know, and, you know, Gooey K points out on the chat, you know, we just saw the thing uh, with Jeremy Lin, uh, the investigation that's going on now where he was called a, a you know, it was had slurs thrown at him, I believe, in a G League game, correct? Is what yeah, he was it, it was related to COVID and coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, this stuff happens. Um I, but I, I I'm sympathetic only in the sense of will like what theoretically could happen. I am not sympathetic to the idea that Myers Leonard somehow you know stumbled into something or like he was caught in a private moment or anything. He was this wasn't an intimate dinner out with friends. He was playing well, he, video games he, on like a public thing, like obviously very comfortable throwing words around. That actually, though, gets to something that I've talked about many times, and this is the umpteenth example of it. Myers Leonard is 29. He is part of a generation that has spent half or more of its life doing everything on social media, doing everything increasingly more public, and I think really does not they're not capable of drawing the distinction between public and private because for a lot of their lives, they've never needed to. And, and I, I think this is just one of those examples of how even somebody in Myers Leonard situation who is a very, you know, he is a very public figure, part of a very popular sport, plays for a very high profile market and wouldn't have the foresight of recognizing I'm playing in a Twitch, I'm playing on Twitch. Like this is visible. Like, mm -hmm. and you know, it's, I think different than frankly, the generation like you and I grew up in, like, you know, it, the, the idea that things, th this is a worldview that you should not subscribe to at all in terms of the use of the slur, but the idea that it would not automatically dawn on you that you should not be saying that in a Twitch broadcasted video game uh, extravaganza. Again, I think it just speaks to the the increasing dangers 
for people basically raised in social media and raised in the world where private and public is so blurred. And I, and I don't say this. It really gives you a great admiration for the way that Derek Jeter was able to make his way through New York. Like, no, seriously, motherfuckers, put your phone. Well, you know what? Like we're not probably, you're not bringing that in my house. Well, but it would have been harder though, if he had started his career in 2009, you know, like mostly because not because it would have been harder, but mostly because it wouldn't have occurred to him to make everybody put their phones in the bowl. Right. Like, what do you mean? Like, I, I, like, and none of his friends would do it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's like, I can't put my phone away for like, it is all right. So anyway, it's not Myers Leonard is going to go away, but the the the, the conversation uh, may not. Uh, tomorrow night, I doubt we'll be talking a ton of Myers Leonard, but with the Lauer after. Well, you never guys, know the Lauer after never know. guys. You know they're they're connected to the Levitard show. That's a very heat centric uh, heat centric program. You know, very it's heat possible. centric viewpoint. I, I don't think it's out of the question that we'll get into Myers Leonard. I do think there's a chance we could talk about an upcoming movie about a uh, cocaine fueled bear. I think that might that come up. That feels more likely. Yes, the cocaine bear. I feel oh, like so that's excited. probably more likely I'm to so come. Excited up. About I will. I, I. I. I am disappointed. This movie hasn't already been made. Um, we need more drugged bear entertainment in the world, uh, not less. So well, that's something that will definitely come up tomorrow uh, as we have the Lauer After Hours guys in what I think is going to be a nano box. Is it a deco box or an octo box? Have we figured that out yet? We, I don't think we have confirmation yet. We're, we're expecting anywhere from eight to 10 of us in total during this show. So, so it's, it's an either- octo, and no less than an octo box, possibly a deco box. Um, it's going to be batshit crazy. I'm not yes. entirely sure what's going to happen or if it's even going to work, but why not? No, um, we, we might literally break this platform by trying yep. to put this many people on, but we're very excited to try it. Thursday night at nine o'clock. We're going to start an nine hour o'clock. earlier Thursday night, nine o'clock. Uh, Michael Lee, the great, great Pablo Escobar. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well, Gooey K. Hey, Gooey K. Pablo Escobar. Um, oh, man, I wish I'd thought of that earlier. I am so pissed. Damn it, Gooey. Um, so <laughs> I'm searching thinking, Twitter now to see if anybody's do done that one. Can you do that at Build-A-Bear? Is there such a thing? Can I go there and make a Pablo Escobar? Um, you should be able to. Uh, so Thursday, we'll have Michael Lee at 9 o'clock. Great, great basketball writers. Going to stay up late for us on the East Coast and join us live midnight his time. And Friday, the Spinsters podcast uh, cast. Haley O'Shaughnessy and Jordan Liggins will be on yeah. with us, and that should be a fun show. And we're going to take next week off because uh, when you do a five day a week show, you need to do that sometimes. <laughs> uh, all right. So tomorrow night, Lauer After Hours in the Deco Box, I think. And we'll see everybody in about 23 hours. Donkey Needle on. <laughs>